Hello and welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. This is the official podcast of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. The Maxwell Institute at Brigham Young University is comprised of scholars who research and write about religious texts from inside and outside the Mormon faith. To keep current with developments at the Institute, you can visit maxwellinstituteblog.org. I'm Blair Hodges, and I'm new to the Institute, and I'll be hosting occasional episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast. I'll be interviewing a variety of scholars, writers, historians, and other Mormon studies practitioners. I hope you've had time to check out the other show under the Maxwell Institute podcast umbrella. It's Kurt Cottle's Mormon Book Review. If you haven't, you can download past episodes through iTunes. In this episode, I sit down with Fiona and Terrell Givens, authors of the new book, The God Who Weeps, How Mormonism Makes Sense of Life. You can email questions or comments about this episode to blairhodges at byu.edu or join the conversation on the Maxwell Institute's Facebook page. We're here with Fiona and Terrell Givens. Uh, Thanks for joining us today on the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you so much for inviting us, Blair. Uh, Fiona, you earned your master's degree in European history just a few years ago at the University of Richmond, and you've worked a little bit in the field of communications, uh, working for a nonprofit, and also done some translation work uh, in German as well. Uh, Terrell um, did his graduate work in intellectual history and comparative literature, and now he's a professor of literature and religion and the James A. Bostwick Professor of English at the University of Richmond. And he's exhaustively written on on Mormon things as well. Uh, Richard Bushman Uh, talks about this. He says, Terrell writes books so easily and so rapidly it seems beyond human capacity. He just keeps uh, coming out with more and more. Um, Terrell knows uh, a lot of, uh, he he incorporates a lot of non-Mormon thinkers into his work as well, so that's a a strength of his work. Um, Currently you're finishing up a source book on Mormonism in America with Reed Nelson. Uh, He's at the Church History Library and that's going to be published by Columbia. Uh, And you're also doing an Oxford Handbook to Mormonism with Phil Barlow. And uh, you're also doing a two-volume work on Mormon theology with Oxford University Press. So a pretty busy time for you, I imagine. Well, it is. Actually, uh, the busy time is mostly in the past. These are all projects that have been submitted or are just about to be submitted to Oxford and Columbia. And what excites you most about about these, these books in particular? Well... Writing them was, was, was a pleasure, especially the two collaborations. It was wonderful working with Reed on the Columbia book and with Phil Barlow on the Oxford Handbook. But I think I'm mostly excited to see the, uh, the history of Mormon theology or of Mormon thought come out, at least the first volume, which is the only one that I've submitted. Uh, that's probably been the most ambitious uh, and all-consuming project that I've ever been engaged in. So I look forward to seeing that finally out. Um. And also, you've been currently heading up the summer seminar here at the Maxwell Institute. And can you talk for a minute about what the sem- summer seminar is? Sure. This is, I think, the 15th or 16th year that we've been doing this. Uh, we call it the Mormon Scholars Foundation Annual Summer Symposium. And the topic rotates from year to year. This year, we are doing it on workings of the spirit and works of the priesthood, gifts and ordinances in LDS thought and practice. And we have 12 wonderful students who've come from around the country, and one from the UK and one from Canada. And they will be presenting the results of their research on these topics this coming Thursday, July 11th uh, at, at BYU. But it's always a wonderful experience to see a group of students from diverse places and backgrounds come together and coalesce into a real, uh, a real unified body of young scholars who uh, get excited about the work and form bonds of friendship that generally persist long after the seminar is over. And some of them continue to go on even further in Mormon studies. I was able to participate in 2010 and some other uh, of my friends and, and, and Spencer Fluman, who who is now the editor of the Mormon Studies Review, uh, before me was a participant of the seminar. Yeah, it seems to have become almost an indispensable rite of passage for anybody who's seriously interested in doing Mormon studies full or part-time. It's significant to note, I think, that the three finalists for the Claremont Chair in Mormon Studies were all graduates of the seminar. The three finalists for the UVA Chair in Mormon Studies were all graduates of the seminar. So we've got a pretty good track record there. That's cool. Um, And you also just published, um, was it last year? You also just published last year a book called The God Who Weeps, and this this was a book that you and Fiona wrote. Fiona, can you can you talk about how this collaboration came about, The God Who Weeps? Well, um, 
we've been working on these ideas. These ideas have been revolving around in our mind for quite some time now. It's um, uh, it, it's been a, a a work in progress for many many years. Uh, Sherid, you um, approached us early last year and asked us if we would be interested in actually putting these ideas into book format. This after. is Sherry Dew from Deseret yeah, Book. Yeah, this is Sherry Dew from Deseret Book. Her assistant had been at the first annual Boncom conference at which Terrell spoke and articulated these five ideas and he was really taken by them and sort of persisted, um, you know, with Sherry and saying, you know, really do need to, to, to get this in a book format. And so she approached Terrell and that was um, the beginning of a really wonderful coalescing of of um, of these ideas together with um, numerous poets philosophers and theologians who had articulated it in such a beautiful way um, the ideas that we feel are most resonant and most fundamental to Mormon thought and and as far as collaboration have you have you and Terrell done something like that before or is this the first um, project like that well, I've, I've always worked with um, Terrell on his other books. I mean, the man is a genius, and so it's been an absolute privilege for me, really. Um, I, I'm generally the first reader, middle reader, and then the final reader of all of his books, and he's very, very accessible. He's very open to um, my opinions, to suggestions for change, to areas of emphasis I think he should take. Uh, so that, that it's just been a joy. Um, but this particular book... Uh, I, I had so much uh, personally invested in it um, that it was um, it, it, it was it was just amazing to to do this together and 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 there was no friction. Of course, there were areas where we, you know we dialogued and uh, had to make some compromises, uh, but I think that happens with all collaborative works. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I think this work really um, demonstrates clearly. Um, where both Terrell and I are coming from as far as um, the fundamentals of Mormon theology. Now, you mentioned compromises in the process of writing it. The book tends to have a pretty univocal voice, so this is a kind of more technical question, but I'm curious, uh, how did you work out who would write the prose, and, and, and was there kind of a back and forth on that? or, or you know? No, no, there was no back and forth on that at all. Um, Terrell is genius in, uh, in writing and also synthesis. If I had written the book, it would probably be three times as long as it is now. Um, my, my tone is much more conversational, and, uh, I, I, and there's enough disparity in the mechanics of our writing and the way we write that in order to make it univocal, we decided Terrell was going to write the book. Um, so it is, it, it's his style that you're seeing. And anybody who's read Terrell's books will recognize that this is, this is Terrell's voice coming through. That being said, those people who know Terrell and myself and, and know where we, that, that those issues are on which we feel very strongly will recognize um, the different voices, Terrell's and my voice in the book. In our own working together on it, we, I think we both lost track of what ideas came from which of us originally? He did. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> she, she takes more note of such things. That's cool. Um, well, I want to talk more about the contents of the book. You mentioned that it sort of circulates around five main ideas. A little bit later in the show, uh, we'll talk about those. But before we get to that, I also want to talk a little bit about some of the firesides and symposia that you and Terrell have been doing over the uh, past uh, few months or the past little while here. And these are gatherings that you've been uh, speaking at um, in terms of faith struggles or questions that people have about their faith, uh, questions that uh, members of the church today are confronting and and it seems the object is to um, to it's almost a pastoral approach to help people uh, find healthy ways to to approach uh, doubt or difficulty. Um, one of the ideas that you bring up in these uh, events is the idea of paradigms and how those can can change and how understanding our own paradigms can kind of be a key to navigating the faith crisis. So, Terrell, if you can take a minute and talk a little bit about paradigms, especially in the context of B.H. Roberts, for example, someone that you've used as an example before. Well, it's our feeling that many of the faith challenges that we face are the consequence not of information per se, but of information that comes into conflict with bad assumptions or what we call faulty paradigms. So I use the example of B.H. Roberts because B.H. Roberts was a great intellectual, great Book of Mormon scholar, 
But when confronted with one question in particular that had to do with how the language Hebrew could morph into hundreds of Native American languages in the span of just several hundred years, uh, he found himself stumped. And uh, initially I thought this was because he didn't consider the possibility of a limited geography model. It turns out that he did. But B.H. Roberts was still rather imprisoned in his belief that there were no other cultures, no other inhabitants of the Americas. And of course, if that were the case, then there would be a genuine problem there indeed. But of course, we recognize as early as Jacob chapter 7 that there's evidence of other peoples, other cultures. And if that, in fact, is the case, that the Book of Mormon people were one among many cultures or civilizations, then the, the problem itself disappears. The question turns out to be based on, on, on faulty assumptions. So in the present presentations that we give, we talk about that false paradigm or misleading paradigm, as well as oh, six or eight or ten others. Um, would you like me to mention some of sure. those? Well, we find that one of the most pervasive um, bad assumptions that members of the church make is that certainty is the norm for believing Mormons. That if you can't stand up and say, I know the church is true, I know there were gold plates, then you have no place really within the Mormon community. And we think it's lamentable that we have forgotten so quickly that the Lord told us in section 46 of the Doctrine and Covenants that to some is given the spiritual gift of knowledge, but to some is given the gift to merely believe and that that is also accounted a spiritual gift. So we try to remind people of that. We also tend to be great hero worshipers. I think that's a universal problem. We forget that prophets and leaders are, are fallible and that the scriptures themselves are replete with instances of the fallibility of prophets from Abraham lying about his sister to Moses killing a man and hiding it to Peter and Paul not being able to get along in the New Testament. Uh, I think that there's a myth that cognitive dissonance is a problem that only exists for believers. Uh, it's, it's our strong impression that cognitive dissonance is just as much a problem for those who reject faith and try to make sense of a, of a multi-varied world of experience and sensation and spiritual intimations and all kinds of things that can't fit comfortably within a secular model. Uh, we think that there's an undue suspicion of feelings. There's this notion that has somehow managed to persist since the Enlightenment that feelings are an impediment to some kind of ideal objectivity. When that's patently absurd, it is, it is on the basis of our feelings that we have been able to thwart some of the excesses of, of hyper-rationalism. Nobody would accuse um, Hitler or Stalin or Mao Zedong of being too feeling in their programs. They were too rationalist. And so we think that feelings are something that we need to value and respect um, because it is from our feelings that we detect moral values, sense of right and wrong. All our strong um, uh, moral intuitions come to us not through the intellect, but through through feelings. I want to follow up on that real quick. The, this idea that um, emotions play a part in what we believe and what we know, and there's there is a, a almost gut reaction of skepticism toward that. This sense that, well, if it's just a good, warm, fuzzy feeling, you could feel that about many different things. So that's not a reliable indicator of truth. We want a scientific method that everybody can experiment with and agree upon and, and, and be objective. But, but it seems to me that uh, we tend to feed that impulse uh, in certain modes of defending the faith. When we buy into the assumptions of some of the the more secular ways of, of proving things. So some of the early studies on the Book of Mormon, for example, where they went to do archaeological digs and didn't, didn't find what they were looking for, and people lost their faith over that and that sort of thing. So this idea that, that emotions play a part in, in what we believe and what we can ultimately claim to know, uh, do you sense that there's resistance toward that idea when you give these uh, well, there, discussions? Well, there sometimes is, I think, among the more naive, uh, you know, Ever since the post-structuralist revolutions, we've realized that, that perfect objectivity is a myth. It's, it's an absurd myth. We strive for a standard of rigor, for example, in the academic world, but very few people any longer talk about this notion of a kind of perfect objectivity that the scholar can achieve. So hyper-rationalism on the one hand and hyper-emotionalism on the other both can lead to catastrophes. And I think that it's highly instructive that the scriptures of the Latter-day Saints encourage them to seek learning by study and by faith. So there has to be a synthesis of the two and a way of finding harmony between the two. I, 
think that's what we're enjoying to pursue. Okay, and then do you have a few more of the points? Well, you know, I have a son, Nathaniel, who's who, who, who says from time to time that the problem with too many Mormons is they think the church is a Swiss army knife. It, it has it has a tool for every uh, for every need, and I think that's true. I think we tend to to over rely on the church, which is meant to be a kind of framework that provides us with an opportunity for service and for coming together in communal worship and for receiving the ordinances of salvation. But we 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 fail to assume the personal responsibility that ultimately is imperative in our spiritual journeys. And then finally, uh, I, I we try to remind people that that they are part of the the Mormon culture that they so often complain about. And as as members of that Mormon culture, we believe that we have both the responsibility and the opportunity to move and to reshape that culture in positive directions. Now, and the other thing when Terrell started, where you started off with the idea of paradigm, um, paradigm shifting, uh, I think that our faith tradition has um, has a really solid basis for paradigm shattering actually when you think of joseph smith in the early 19th century he is expanding the view of a vulnerable god when jonathan edwards god still loomed large in most people's minds and and to a certain extent i think unfortunately in the church but that was a huge paradigm shift um, the idea that um, Eve is the heroine of the human family, that sin is an educative process, mortality is educative, not punitive, um, and the idea of pre-existence, which actually Joseph really didn't elaborate on that much. Um, it'd be much, much better elaborated, I think, particularly by Edward Beecher, but by, by many people through the centuries. But these are huge paradigm-shifting things in which Joseph is engaged. Um, the I, and I think this is, for Terrell and me, this is probably the most magnanimous thing. You know, what do you do um, with a Christian tradition that says everybody has to be baptized in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? And you know that there are billions of people who have never been baptized, will never be baptized. And so this idea of temples being um, that sacred space in which these, these ordinances can be done vicariously for all of these people, I mean, it's extraordinary, you know. Um, Christoph Stendhal um, stands in holy envy of this. It's absolutely remarkable, and it came out of nowhere, um, pretty much. And then the idea of, of of heaven not being a blue sky heaven, but being a continuation of those relationships, friendships, and loves that we have here on earth. I mean, these are paradigm shifting things that Joseph um, inculcated and elaborated. On. And it's absolutely amazing. I think. I mean, that that is where our strength lies as a faith tradition. I think and those five things um, that, that Joseph did. And these are all paradigm-shattering moments. Do you, do you expect any more of those? I mean, with Joseph, they, they seem to just keep coming one on top of the other. Um, and since that time, it's almost been a process of, of Mormons figuring some of those things out that Joseph didn't even have an opportunity to flesh out. I think that in this case, the Mormon church is closer to the Catholic tradition than we often realize. That there is a kind of a deposit of original faith, both in the Mormon sense one could say going all the way back to Adam, but more immediately going back to Joseph Smith and the corpus of revelations and inspired pronouncements that he delivered. And I think that, yes, in fact, we have spent a long time ferreting out and explicating the, the rich resources of his thinking. I'll, I'll, I'll refer to just one simple example. Joseph Smith pronounced very early, well, in the 1840s, he referred to a, the, the, the great work of sealing is something in which we need to seal our children to us and ourselves to our forefathers. But that kind of linear transgenerational temple work wasn't really introduced until 1894 by Wilfred Woodruff. So in that case, it took a full 50 years to finally appreciate and implement the kind of temple program that Joseph Smith hinted at in the, in the 1840s. And then to follow that, you know, Joseph Smith said that we had a heavenly mother. Wow, where did that come from? And the, the idea of a heavenly mother is now becoming really, really sexy in the academic tradition. So I think that's really interesting. There are some things which, which Joseph just sort of put out there that really haven't been fully articulated or developed in Mormon thought. And, you know, I, I think this is definitely sort of a zeitgeist. It's like everybody is, you know, thinking of heavenly mother. Um, there's anthropo anthropological evidence for her, extra canonical evidence. I mean, it's just very, very exciting that we, we may be on a threshold of sort of sort of a new revelation or, or an expanded view 
of who Heavenly Mother is and, and her characteristics and attributes, because at the moment we really have no theology of a Heavenly Mother, but, but that, that is not to say that there is not one coming and just that the, 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 the focus of attention on, on, on her at the moment, I think, is, is very, very exciting. I, I, I really do think that, that, that things are going to come to light and um, I, I just think we're in a historic moment and um, this is one of those historically extraordinary things that, are, that in which we are now all engaged. That's actually one of the questions that was submitted um, by one of the uh, people on the Maxwell Institute Facebook page that the question was if, if both parents here on earth are, are thought to be crucial for a child's development uh, in this life, then then why would we? some people feel that we're spiritually being raised by a single father because we don't talk much about a heavenly mother. No, you're absolutely right. I, th I think one of the problems is we don't have a theology for her. Uh, there is no canon that actually expressly talks about heavenly mother. You can find her, most definitely. I mean, I think if you look at Proverbs, um, and wisdom, uh, you know, it's extraordinary. You have proverb um, wisdom personified as a she, and then at this radical moment in Pro Proverbs three, she, she turns Proverbs around eight. and says, Proverbs eight, thank you, my darling. She turns around and says, I, I was in the beginning. It's so redolent of John one one. So I, I, I think there are definitely indications, but but a sustained theology of her we do not as yet have. Um, that being said, um, our, our theology of of heavenly father has been. I mean, Joseph said, you know, many plain and precious things have been taken out of the biblical text. And I think those plain and precious things actually had to do with the characteristics and attributes of God. Um, and, and he brought those back. Um, that, that being said, um, we, we don't have God sorted out, God the Father sorted out. And the other thing is, it's so much easier if one looks at the way God is portrayed, particularly in the Old Testament, it makes them fairly inaccessible. Um, and, and again, go to the Catholic faith tradition. I was raised Catholic. I understand what's going on here. And you have Christ and he appears to be vulnerable and compassionate, and benevolent, but he also says some pretty scary things. So, you know, what do you do? How much of the father is in the son? How much of the mother is in the son? And, and one isn't seeing a huge um, influence there. For, for me, it was, it was really important that Christ was a man quite honestly I think he was a, a great combination of both Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother and if he had been a woman I don't think anybody would have noticed to be quite honest but 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 I can understand in the Catholic tradition why people um, the Catholics go to Mary as the intercessor she has become now the intercessor she's completely taken over for most Catholics the role of Christ and and, and I think it's because it's difficult it's, it's, it's a wonderful you know scripture you know um, to whom shall we go? I mean, the things that you're saying, Lord, are really, really difficult, but we really don't know what to do. And we, we, we have this 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 um, Heavenly Father figure that's been horribly misconstrued. And it's, all, it's also, you know, our own personal experience with our own fathers. It's much easier to go to the mother figure. She tends to be more merciful, kind, suffering, um, and um, empathic. Um, but the, but the, the injunction in the New Testament is to pray to our Heavenly Father. That is difficult. It's a hard thing to do. So once we understand who he really is, I think that will make um, a, a huge difference. That's That actually brings up the next uh, topic, which is this idea that some people, when they, when they think about Heavenly Mother or when they think about some of these other difficult issues, they start to think they start to feel a little bit out of place or they feel a little bit out of joint. There's, there's an anxiety attached to doubt uh, I think for, for a lot of members of the church who encounter doubt, there's an anxiety attached to it, uh, or maybe even a sense that there's something wrong with having doubts or something wrong with having these types of questions. So I hope both of uh, you can speak to that idea of, is, is there a, a sinful nature of, of doubting, or what's your perspective on that? Um, no, for, um, for us, doubt is absolutely crucial. Uh, I mean, um, for all of these qualities, the divine qualities which we are trying to develop in our mortal life, patience, long-suffering, tenderness, mercy, forgiveness, those can only be developed if they are challenged. Um, quite honestly, you can only become patient if somebody is challenging your patience. And we feel that faith is the same way. Um, in order for faith to really be faith, it has to be challenged. Otherwise, it's, it's, it's really nothing. The, the challenge to the faith is absolutely imperative. It, it forces us to engage with, on our, with our faith on a much more profound level, and it should be transformative. Um, we all believe that, you know, that testimonies are living 
um, living things. They can be killed and they can grow. They can be vibrant. They can die. Um, and so, so the, the challenges to our faith give us a, give us space in which we can engage with our faith on a, on a very very deep level. And it should be a transformative experience. So that coming out of faith crisis, we should be seeing the world through a much more empathic um, and, and very different paradigm from how we were and how we viewed the world and ourselves and our God and the gospel and the people by whom we are surrounded when we entered into that faith crisis. Terrell, I know you've got something to add to that. Yeah, well, I think that, you know, the talk that Elder Holland gave in this last conference was in this regard a landmark talk because he fully acknowledged the reality of doubt among many of the members of the church. And he was, it seems to me, extremely clear in suggesting that that is not a position that we should condemn or scorn or hide from that, uh, as he quoted from the lo lovely story in Mark, the Lord himself blessed those who came to him with an open acknowledgement of their doubt. I think Fiona is, is, is right, as she has commented in other contexts, that in many cases the resistance that we encounter is from people who are themselves insecure, and they don't want to contemplate the possibility that their paradigm may be subject to questioning. But I think, ultimately, the bottom line is this. It behooves us to speak and act with integrity and to stop using <clears throat> this so-called right, oppressive, frightening, scary Mormon culture as an excuse to not stand up on Testimony Sundays and speak from the heart with authenticity and honesty. So what are some practical things to do then, uh, to, to push back a little bit on that, is the idea that I, some people get the sense I should... Forget some people. I, I might get the sense in a church meeting that it would be inappropriate during certain lessons to to voice a doubt or to raise a question that I that I just I think would would sort of bring a, a strange spirit into the room rather than just kind of letting the lesson go the way that it was supposed to go. So practically speaking, uh, it seems most Mormons would probably hear this and agree, but then on the, when their feet are on the ground, they they might not feel there's a real space uh, to do that in a church setting. No, you are you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I think that is a, a general a general feeling and a general fear. I mean, there are two things I want to address. There's the, 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 the lessons in which we engage, and then there are testimonies which we bear. Now, in the lessons, I think it, it, it's entirely appropriate, and, and, and unfortunately, I don't think we're conducting Sunday school in the way the Lord had wanted it. I, from my reading of the Doctrine and Covenants, it's, it seems to me quite clear that the Lord is looking at a discussion format with a discussion leader rather than a, a lay person who is not... Um, uh, has not gone through seminary or, uh, you know, Mormon history programs. Um, and so this isn't a question and answer format. So I think in those in those um, Sunday school classes, for instance, you know, expressing a doubt, I, there, there, there's one tone. Tone is hugely important. Um, and if we, if we can remember that love and friendship is to be the basis of all of our discussions, I think that will really help. And then, and then if we just turn it to ourselves rather than saying, well, I think you're completely wrong or you are completely wrong. I just say, you know, my feeling is, my experience is, my reading is this and this and this. So you're just simply putting it on the table. Um, to be discussed. I think I think that would be very helpful. I think it would also be extraordinarily helpful if all of us were going to our Sunday school classes, quite frankly, having read the scriptures for that particular day. I think it would elevate the discourse considerably um, and, um, and, and and animate the discussion. I think too much we're, we're relying on our Sunday school teachers to, you know, we ask questions and we expect them to give the answers. It's totally not fair. That, that we're just simply not trained that way. And the other thing I'd like to address is, uh, is our fast um, and testimony meetings, the, the testimonies we bear, and, and Terrell has alluded to this, I think it's absolutely right. I think the, the Holy Spirit can really only function in an atmosphere of complete and on, on, honesty and authenticity. And, and, and the idea of, you know, going up and saying that we know most of us don't know certain things. You know, for myself, I know that Jesus is the Christ. That is the only thing that I can say categorically that I know off by heart. And there are other things, that, but there, I think there should be space. And I think there is space. It's, it's going to take some courage because we are changing culture here. And, and, and changing culture always requires courage. Um, but, I, I, but I think we underestimate the love um, and the resilience of our, of our congregations, quite honestly. Um, those, pe those friends of ours who've actually gone up to the podium and said, I don't know. You know, I believe, I, I do know that when I have scripture study, that the atmosphere in my home is much more lovely. I feel more empowered. I feel better about myself studying the scriptures. Those sort of testimonies are authentic. They are valuable. And I think they provide space for the spirit to actually enter 
our congregation and 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 manifest um, himself. So, uh, but it does it does require courage, uh, uh, undoubtedly. But I think we I think we need in all of our experiences, the congregations have responded in such a positive, loving way. Thank you. I, I, I think that's great. So a couple of practical things then just when you do choose the right time, you use the right tone, be confident, be authentic, be honest. Absolutely. Um, and, 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 and be loving. And be loving. Do, do, it, do it in a context of, of love. Um, okay. Um, the other thing that uh, that Terrell actually mentioned uh, last week at the gathering you, you had uh, was this idea of a, a, a North Star. He, he said, you need to find your North Star. And for Terrell, it was a scripture. You mentioned Galatians 5. Can you talk about what you mean by finding a North Star? And I'd also like to hear more about why that in particular became yours, sort of the circumstance behind that. Well, I, <clears throat> I think that we all need kind of scriptural anchors or, well, yeah, I call it a North Star, meaning some ultimate criterion by which we evaluate the validity and the value of the truths that we espouse. I mean, Richard Bushman has referred to the, the kind of pragmatic dimension of, of gospel standards, meaning that they have to work, they have to function if they are true. So there's a relationship here between their inherent goodness and their, and their truthfulness. So Galatians 5.22 simply tells us that the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, and gentleness. And if those things are increasingly manifest to the extent that we embrace and live by gospel teachings, and that seems to me the most powerful indicator that they are good, that their origin is divine, that they are true. Contrarywise, it seems to me that to the extent that we remove ourselves from the community of saints and from these teachings, if we apply that same standard, it's imperative that we know whether or not we are moving closer to those virtues of peace, love, joy, and gentleness, or further away. And so that's that's become my my north star in that regard. And and, and I you know I, I just I just love Terrell's um, conception of that. I, I think he's absolutely right. We all have to have a north star. My north star is Moses six and seven, uh, section one hundred and twenty one, and then Romans eight. Blair, do you mind if I read this? Sure. Um, because this this is probably um, for me my north star. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present or things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think that's absolutely fundamental. And and what I have learned, my experience is that God loves us in our sins. It's very difficult for Mormons to get under, understand that sin is actually not some evil thing that they're going to be able to avoid because we can't avoid it. And, and I think it's quite frankly, a, my very close reading of Julian of Norwich's showings and, 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 and the authenticity with which she articulated um, her beliefs is the fact that God, God's love is unconditional. Um, there is nothing that we can do that can separate us from his love. He loves us in our sins. He cannot save us in our sins. It's a very different thing altogether. That would be a violation of agency. But if we could just understand um, that those feelings of guilt and shame with which we are so often beset, if they are driving a wedge between ourselves and our God and ourselves and our loved ones, then it is not coming from God. God's whole purpose is to draw us closer to him. So, you know, sin should be sort of like that. And Terrell, I think, articulates it so beautifully in the book, you know, that twist of the ankle, you know, don't push this further or you're really going to be in pain. Um, I, I just thought that was an absolutely brilliant concept of his, and uh, and I think he's absolutely right. That's how we should be looking at it. Um, and if we're not drawing forward closer, or we feel that something is impeding us from drawing closer to God, then then we really need to be seriously looking at this, because this is not this is not the relationship that God wants with us. It seems that another way that that you both have have tried to talk about faith crisis and and what people might do when they're when they have doubts and questions is is to explore the idea of agency. So, uh, so Terrell, for example, you, you've said that, that you believe that uh, people are, can be confronted with things that, that would indicate belief is right, things that would indicate that you, that you ought to doubt, and that it becomes a, a moral question or the purest reflection of who you are uh, according to what choice you make in that moment. And 
people that have, have sort of talked about that, it, it can easily be caricatured to where it seems that you're positing this perfect scenario where everybody's faced with with this amount of reasons to doubt and this amount of reasons to believe, and so it's a, it's a draw, so you've got to use faith and choose one or the other. That's kind of the caricature of, of that perspective, and I, I hope you can speak to that and maybe give a, a, a more perspective as to what you, you mean by that construct. Well, I don't believe that we all exist in the exact same condition of perfect equilibrium between two alternatives. But I do believe that for the vast majority of human beings, there are reasons to believe that there is a God, a benevolent deity who presides over the universe. If, if, if that evidence uh, stretches no further than the beauty of the universe and, and, you know, and the smile of, of newborn children and, 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 and the affection of loved ones. And similarly, I believe that for virtually all people in or outside of faith tradition, there are, there are good reasons to deny the existence of a, of a benevolent deity if those reasons stretch no further than the extent of human pain and suffering in the world that is not of their own making. So my point is simply that we live in a world of complex stimuli and conditions that create the necessity for us to exercise judgment and make a decision as to whether we will believe or not believe. That There is seldom so much paucity of evidence that we don't have the opportunity to believe. And there is seldom so much overwhelming manifestations of God's reality that we are compelled to believe. And so it seems to me consistent with the divine purposes behind our, in, our, our, our mortal existence that we should have to reach out of ourselves, that we should have to reveal something about our yearnings, our desires, what it is that we recognize and cleave to in the universe by making a choice. And I think that choice will necessarily entail risk. And I think that it is also a greater manifestation of love if we believe without being compelled to believe, than if we do it as a gesture of reaching out toward something that we devoutly hope to be true and real. And the, the other thing, I think this is really, really important, Terrell and I have discussed this, um, is the fact that we are on an uneven playing field. At the end of the day, we never make decisions with um, full information. Um, we, we are constantly hampered, hampered by genetics, environment, upbringing, hormones, um, chemical imbalances. I mean, there is so much um, white noise and so much secondary smoke with which we are dealing that it really does impinge on our ability to make um, a, 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 a choice that is, that is um, not impeded by all of these other things. That being said, um, I, I, I think this is a really, that, that, I think that's why we have this, um, this idea that, you know, Mortality is the time to prepare, which because it's the most difficult stage, quite frankly. Um, I, I really don't believe that pre-existence and post-existence, that we are going to be confronted by all of this white smoke, all of these impediments to making um, decisions with full information. We never do. We never do. Um, and that being said, I think what Terrell said about feelings earlier and emotions and those those instances where we where we are we recognise that 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 our minds can be as easily manipulated as anything else that we are we are not making a fully informed choice we never are that 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 those times we have to rely on the feelings of our heart and our consciences that that's the only thing that that's the guiding light with which we have to work we have to be at the end of the day and this is what prompted me to join the church in the first place was actually listening to Shakespeare's words, above all to thine own self be true. You have to go deep down inside. How does this feel? You know, what is this going to do? So it's a much more personal, much more responsibility, self-responsibility laden decision that we make at the end of the day. But I think we could be much easier on ourselves if we recognize that we don't have all the information and that we are being manipulated by all sorts of things. Now within Mormonism, something that that, that would seem to, to counter that or to, to maybe... Uh, make that a little more difficult to employ is the idea of having uh, authority outside of oneself that, that we have to rely on. So God sends prophets, for example, that we listen to. And and there's this sense that, you know, when the prophet speaks, the thinking has been done. 
So you might have doubts or whatnot, but, but if the prophet said so, that, then you just need to go along with it. Uh, or President Woodruff, the quote that's in the Doctrine and Covenants that says the prophet will never lead the church astray and that sort of thing. So how do you, how do you fit those types of, of claims with your Shakespeare quote about to thine own self be true? Because there does seem to be, within Mormonism, a, a, also a need for allegiance to, to authority outside of oneself as well. Well, I think that there are two quotes that are sufficient to dispel the myth that when the leaders speak, the thinking has been done. And by the way, the church presidency officially disavowed <clears throat> that position in a published statement. Brigham Young in the 19th century spoke out forcefully against this tendency to slavishly and blindly follow the dictates of the brethren. And it's pretty striking that a prophet himself of his stature and authoritarian bent would say, I'm fearful that the saints will settle down in a state of blind self-security, trusting their eternal destiny in the hands of their leaders with reckless confidence. That's pretty strong language. So he's emphatically insisting there that everything that the prophets say is something that needs to be vetted in our own private conscience. <clears throat> and then more recently in the 20th century, J. Reuben Clark spoke to the same thing. when He said, ultimately, there's only one way to know if the leaders are speaking for the Lord and that is when we ourselves are moved upon by the Holy Ghost. So I love the fact that in both cases they have said the responsibility lies with us, not with our leaders. And, and I could just add as a kind of commentary here that, you know, the, the great writer Dostoevsky in the scene, The Grand Inquisitor from the Brothers Karamazov, talks about this human propensity toward hero worship. And he said it's, it, it's, it seems on the face of it that we are following our leaders out of devotion. He said, but more often... The real motive is we want them to be keepers of our conscience. And I think that's a powerful and beautiful articulation of that human weakness. We want somebody else to have moral responsibility for our choices, but God won't let us off so easy. Well, it seems that these quotes are from general authorities, but they don't seem to be a common theme today, right? I mean, in lessons and <clears throat> teachings of the president of the church or things like that, you don't hear them across the pulpit very often, right? Well, I think you heard uh, similar, a similar statement recently by, by Elder Christofferson, and I can't remember the exact quotation, <clears throat> but he was indicating the, the notion that the leaders can be fallible, that they can make mistakes, that not everything they say is binding upon us as church doctrine. So I think the fact that these kinds of statements are part of the historical record, they're available to us, it behooves us to be more familiar mm -hmm. with this aspect of our own faith tradition. No, no, I, I actually second that. You know, the responsibility at the end of the day with us, you know, we need to become church historians. Um, we need to engage with the scriptures ourselves. We need to engage with our history. We need to become much more informed. Um, the responsibility at the end of the day is ours. And we really can't, you know, look to the leaders all the time and assume because we're abdicating responsibility that is ours. We're cheating. We can't cheat. Um, so I, I think it behooves us as members of the church, as church, quite frankly, is to, as you know, as huge as it is, read the Joseph Smith papers. We need that it's out there. We can't complain anymore that we don't have sources to which to go. So we need to go to them. The responsibility is ours. We need to educate ourselves. Now, while we're talking about the subject of authority, uh, before we move on to the next topic, I also just want to ask you quickly another question that came in from a listener: uh, is in the idea of women in authority. So recently there have been movements, there's a website ordained women, there there are uh, different people that have different perspectives on that. Um, now from your point of view, you mentioned uh, in the gathering this last week that there are many changes, cosmetic changes you called them, that, that could happen within the church today w without even going to uh, ordination yet, right? Uh, what sort of things did you mean by that? Well, actually, I was re relying on Nile McBain. She gave an absolutely fabulous lecture at the fair conference in which she said, I mean, quite honestly, we're all about the ward. And even though they're, you know, the, um, the women are visible on, you know, on those front seats in general conference, the cameras don't focus there. The cameras focus on the podium. So what we're seeing is every Sunday in church, we see a sea of suits. And, and there are men in them. And uh, so what, it was actually Nileen's suggestion. I thought it was brilliant, you know, put the Relief Society presidency up there along with men, you know, just change the color, you know, change, you know, have, have gender equality visible. Um, because quite frankly, I, I, I do feel that the women of the church have in, incredible responsibilities, um, particularly over the, the, the formation of young children's mind and young women's mind. I mean, that's, especially children, it's absolutely enormous. 
Um, and uh, j j she, again, she had just wonderful things, you know, in, in um, Joan Sacrament. Why have boys be ushers? Why not have the 12 year old girls be ushers? And then she also made the suggestion of, you know, the, 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 the priests are, you know, starting at each row. They actually don't pass the sacrament, we pass it to each other. Um, but she thought, you know, what a great idea if the laurels actually were in charge of the sacrament meeting program. I mean, these are minor changes. Um, and, and when I say cosmetic, I don't mean superficial. I, I think they would actually really um, change the whole tone um, of, of our ward meetings. And we're inviting our friends into these. Um, so I think it would be really lovely. Oh, gosh, there are women up there as well as men. There are women in authority up there as well. I think that would be really, really helpful. We're here with Terrell and Fiona Givens. They're talking to us today about their book, The God Who Weeps, and also uh, some of the gatherings that they participated in talking about uh, faith and doubt. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the idea that, uh, that, that you both have emphasized in Joseph Smith's teachings about gathering truth from many different places, gathering truth uh, from, from out in the world, bringing it in uh, to Mormonism. So there's a quote from Terrell uh, here that says, what we've learned most importantly is that all these voices from other times, cultures, and traditions don't corroborate our faith, they enrich our faith. So I, I want you to speak to that a little bit because there's a sense that when we search for truth out in the world, we're really looking for pieces of Mormonism that we already believe. Uh, and, I, and I want you to talk about that a little bit. Well, if we look to other traditions to corroborate our own faith, then that presupposes that our own faith has a monopoly on the truth, to, and, and that all other traditions can hope to do is to reflect that. Joseph Smith's vision was quite different, and Fiona can talk about the, 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 the allegory of the woman in the wilderness, to which Joseph Smith resorted in describing his mission in the fifth section of the Doctrine and Covenants. He likened his prophetic restoration uh, calling to that of bringing the church out of the wilderness, which suggests gathering and synthesis rather than pure innovation. And I think Joseph Smith was very explicit about the need to go outside of the faith, to find truth wherever it was, and to bring it home to Zion, to add to, to enhance, and to enrich the, the, the depository of faith that we already have, not merely to corroborate it. And we feel that in section 49 of the Doctrine and Covenants, when he referred to holy men that ye know not of, he was again paying homage to, the, to, to the, the many men and women, devout, pious, and in many cases, inspired men and women who have much to teach us outside of our own faith tradition. Fiona, speak to that. The, the, what's this idea about the, the woman in the wilderness? Yes, no, it's uh, Revelation 12. It's an absolutely extraordinary um, group of verses. Um, we have this, you know, woman, she's displayed, you know, portrayed as really regal. She is expecting a child. Then you have another vision open, the great red dragon, who with his tail takes away the third of the host of heaven. So you have Lucifer. Um, and uh, then our understanding is that the child is um, the Lord. He's taken up and the woman is the church and she has left to confront the dragon. And she knows that the, the dragon will completely overpower her. She does not have the strength to stand against the dragon, so she turns and she flees. And where does she flee? She flees into the world wilderness, which we call the apostasy. And then there's this extraordinary sentence where God hath prepared a place for her to nourish her. That is extraordinary. And it's like, how does God nourish a church in an apostasy? Well, he sends to his church the greatest luminaries of all time, the greatest poets, artists, um, composers, writers. Uh, God never creates ex, ex nihilo. You know, he's, he's not going to be able to restore a church if there isn't something already there. Um, restoration implies that there is something there to restore. And uh, so, you know, we, ha we have, you know, there we have Goethe, Schiller, Shakespeare, Milton. I mean, these great luminaries. There will be no more of them. And I think, I think this is our understanding. Unfortunately, one of this misconception that maybe we can produce more Shakespeare's, Beethoven's, and Mozart's. No, no, God doesn't do that. He, he's given us each one of these for a very, very important reason, and they articulate truth in a, in a way that we cannot. And Terrell's and my um, one of our favorite luminaries is Edward Beecher, and 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 his discussion of the fall in heaven is act. Absolutely remarkable because Terrell and I have both said coercion was not what was going on. 
Um, Satan was much, Lucifer was much too subtle, much too intelligent to be, to be stupid enough to use either mental or physical coercion. And, and, and we are much too intelligent to have fallen for that. But I, I just want to mention what, what, what um, Edward Beecher in Concord of Ages does say, which I think is absolutely brilliant and novel. From pleasure, of course, there was no temptation to revolt, but from a discipline of suffering such as they needed to fit them to be the founders of the universe with God, they could be tempted to revolt. Now that is extraordinary, given the fact that, you know, mortality is the time to, um, meet, to prepare to meet God because it consists of this suffering in which we are all engaged in, we suffer. And yes, that would be something that Lucifer could revolt against. And perhaps it was out of love. You know, he didn't want us to suffer. I mean, but, but it's brilliant, you know, and, and this is this is coming from somebody outside of our, of our faith tradition, articulating something that really resonates very powerfully with me, given the fact, uh, given my experiences in, in my mortal probation and those of my children. Terrell, you've you've written, um, you've written that historically speaking, Mormons became disinclined to emphasize their unique theology. You wrote a book about Parley P. Pratt with, with Matt Groh. Uh, and in that book, you talked about Parley as a as an apostle who was willing to go out in the fray, and and daringly, brazenly talk about Mormon doctrine. And he would say, "Oh, you think we believe this? Well, I'll, we actually believe even more. Let me tell you more." Um, and then there was a shift from that sort of approach around uh, from that time. And and one of the landmarks would be the Chicago World's Fair about 1893, when when Mormons show up and and you know, their B.H. Roberts is excluded from the theological discussions, but Mormons are embraced. The Tabernacle Choir is there, and they make a big showing. They take second place, uh, and, and there's this sense that Mormons were finding a way to fit in uh, nationally at this time. So, so there's less emphasis on the theology, more emphasis on on who Mormons are as people. The "I'm a Mormon" campaign of 1893s you want to call yeah, it that. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about those shifts and then we'll we'll kind of situate your uh, work within that arc of history. Well, I think one of the most deeply rooted senses of ambivalence in Mormon culture is the oscillation between emphasizing our difference and differences with the Christian world and emphasizes our commonality. So you go back all the way to the Articles of Faith and you begin with an assertion that puts us right firmly in the Christian camp. We believe in the in the in the Godhead. And then you go to the second article of faith and you situate us dramatically outside that tradition by negating the doctrine of the fall. Okay, and that sets up the paradigm which is going to be consistently maintained through 180 years more of history. Um, what happens by the late 19th century, of course, is that Mormonism has embarked on the campaign of, an Amer of Americanization. And I think that partly for reasons of political expediency, there was a growing tendency to downplay the theological uniqueness of Mormonism. So what happens at the Chicago World's Fair, as you mentioned, is that in, at one and the same venue, within a period of days, the Mormon church is celebrated for their Mormon Tabernacle Choir, and they are absolutely shut down when it comes to B.H. Roberts' attempt to present a paper on Mormon theology. So the compromise that comes out of that World's Fair is Mormons, you are welcome to sing and dance for us, but don't ask us to take your theology seriously. And it's my contention that we are complicit in that compromise and that we have been relatively happy with it for the next hundred more years. Uh, the evidence of that is the fact that we are so quick to tout our football teams and our singing stars and our dancers and our cultural greatness while doing very little in a public way to promote the most conspicuous elements of Mormon theology. As you pointed out, Parley Pratt was a powerful contrary example. In 1838, it was first alleged by an editor named Sutherland that Mormons were teaching they could become like God. Parley Pratt responds to that essay, and rather than say, well, not exactly, he says, you bet we do. Not only that, we think we can be fully equal with the gods. And that's not the direction that we take today. And I was asked by a, a a group of, of consultants to church public affairs and communications, whether in fact it isn't impossible to teach theology in 30-second spots. And I said, well, that, 
Absolutely not. 30 seconds is plenty of time to say, we believe in a God whose heart beats in sympathy with human hearts, or we believe we, we lived with God as pre-existent children in the pre-existence. And you could go all through the, the, the distinctions of Mormon doctrine. I think that, that in many cases, we're not taking the pulse of America or the Western world accurately. The problem with religion today is that it is too, it's, it's too easy. It's too much like just another social club. What most of the people, it seems to me, in, in search of the truth are looking for is something that is radically distinct. And Mormonism offers that radical distinctness, and I think that's what should be emphasized. The question that that leads to is, is you know, you had Parley P. Pratt going out and doing these things publicly with, with non-Mormons. You had this sort of thing. Um, today, we have people like you, Fiona, uh, Richard Bushman, um, doing firesides and doing symposia. So the question that a lot of people sent in is, why is it that, that it's you uh, presenting these ideas and talking about cultural shifts and talking about these types of issues and not general authorities or, or not across the pulpit in general conference? It's a common question. I assume you've heard it before. Well, we've heard it in connection, especially with the firesides and talks that we give in connection with doubt and faith challenges. And I, I guess I would have two answers. One is to say, well, to some extent, the brethren are addressing these issues, such as Elder Holland at the last general conference. Actually, I guess three responses. The second is that the church is responding in, uh, with actions rather than mere words. The Joseph Smith Papers Project, the Mountain Meadows Massacre book, uh, a whole plethora of projects and initiatives under the direction of the First Presidency or the Historical Department show that church is serious for the first time in its history about really achieving the goal of transparency. And 50 years ago, Joseph Smith papers would have been absolutely inconceivable. In fact, we know that, that, that only 20 years or so ago, a historian submitted to the Ensign an article on the evolution of some of Joseph Smith's revelations as they went through subsequent editing versions. And the response was apparently well, we can't do that. What will the members think if they know that Joseph subjected his own revelations to editing? Now, not only does the historical department acknowledge that, but they are publishing to the world those very versions that manifest each subsequent change made to every word that Joseph Smith ever wrote. There was an article in the Enzyme about it. Too, <laughs> exactly. So I think it's clear that we have shifted into a new paradigm. And then the third point that I would make is, well, I, I can't second guess what the brethren are talking about or doing, but I have faith that they're, that they're giving talks and presentations in different fora suited to the inspiration that they're receiving. And we're simply trying to bear testimony to things that we feel called upon to testify in the small orbit of influence given to us. And I would like to add a fourth thing, is that I think we need to be so much more generous with the brethren. They, they are dealing with the problems of a global church. You know, my concern is that we tend to be so America-centric and that whatever issues are that are ours at the moment, those must take precedent in the minds of, of the quorum when in actual fact they have so many other pressing needs with which they are engaged and which with which they should be engaged. So I'm, 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 I think we need to get away from this sort of self-centeredness that I think we are at times um, entertaining and, and recognize that um, the brethren are dealing with global issues of enormous magnitude. And, and really that the primary thrust of, of, of their calling is to ensure that the gospel message um, finds access into all corners of the globe and that, that, that men and women everywhere have accesses to the ordinances of the temple. I mean, these surely are, are, are enormous weighty issues which, in which they are engaged in. And I think if we could actually, you know, sort of move our paradigm out a little bit to respect the fact of the matter that, that this is the work that is most important to them is proclaiming the good news of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and then enabling that message to actually move around the globe. Um, surely that is their most important um, office and calling and, and job at the end of the day. I, th I think we, much, we, we need to be much more generous with how broad the field and importance of their, their callings are. So it kind of sounds like you're saying they they function in their in their sphere and that other the scripture that comes to mind is from the doctrine and covenants that talks about everybody uh, you know 
being anxiously engaged in a good cause and not, not waiting around for uh, other people to do that. And so you and Terrell have had opportunities to, to, do, to engage with other members of the church, to be anxiously engaged. But when you do that, though, you bring the gravitas of, of a education. Terrell's a professor. You, you have an advanced degree. Um, so when you do these things, you bring that along with you. And so I'd, I'd hope that you can both kind of talk about uh, the, the spiritual and academic commitments that, that you face. Um, and this idea that, that uh, you're not just functioning, you know, people would say, are you functioning just as apologists or are you engaging in strict academic scholarship? So talk about um, the relationship between re your religious faith and your academic work, uh, Terrell and, and, and then Fiona. Well, I think that uh, there is a great distinction that needs to be made based on the kinds of audiences and the kinds of forums in which we find ourselves speaking. Now, I know that there are some people who would argue for a radical divide, radical separation between academic um, language interests and personality and my spiritual identity. Um, I, I've always been influenced by Elder Maxwell, who, who warned us as believing scholars to never uh, consider ourselves to have membership in the academic world with a passport into the spiritual I have found that the best way to synthesize those two competing paradigms in my own life is to, is to feel very strongly that my spiritual identity is what shapes the questions that I ask. But I answer those questions within the academy according to the standards of my discipline. That way I am able to communicate in a language and in a manner and in a methodology that is academically credible and rigorous, but I'm ultimately in the pursuit of questions that are of special meaning to me, and in some cases I hope to have other people who share my faith commitments. So I don't see any necessary conflict. I think that, that, that one can work in perfect harmony between those two worlds in such a way. And, and when we're talking about ac academy, I think we're really talking about Mormon scholarship here. Um, and, and the fact of the matter is we really cannot um, divest our theology from our history or the other way around. So, you know, if you're, if you're in, in Mormon studies, for example, I think, you know, this negotiation of, 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 of spirit and, and faith and then academic rigor, definitely, I mean, I think, I think there's a, a fine line um, in my academic work, for instance, um, I am, I'm embarking on a project which I've been looking forward to embark on for many, many years, and that is to, um, to explore the experiences of the German POWs in the Soviet camps from 1945 to 1955. It really hasn't been addressed by historians. Um, and so, so this is a completely different academic world now in which I am engaged, in which I, I really don't feel I will you know, have to engage my, my faith with my spirit is, is, is this something completely removed um, a, 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 except for the fact that, you know, this is, this is an area of history that has not been explored and, and, and uh, these young men's stories need to be told. So uh, it, it, it's, it must be very careful not to conflate academy to just Mormon studies because there are many of us engaged in, in, in these projects that are actually have interests in academic disciplines that are very far removed from Mormon studies. I want to circle back to the conversation about uh, the faith decision choosing, right? Um, I was reading Richard Bushman's On the Road with Joseph Smith, and, and in that book he reflects on his faith and, and being a, a Mormon scholar and, and sort of how he negotiated uh, that identity. And, and he talked about, uh, you know, people say, well, how can you know these things and still be a Mormon? You know, as though as though he had made some sort of choice about it. But with Richard, he says, well, yeah, you know, I didn't really choose this. He, I, I just, I just am a, Mom a Mormon. <laughs> like it's part of me, and it, and I couldn't get rid of it if I wanted to. So for, I wonder how you would situate his kind of of experience within, uh, within your view of of the life of faith and doubt, uh, the experience of a Richard Bushman or someone else who just that's just who they are. So they don't feel that there was ever a choice made. I know some unbelievers who, who sort of feel that way as well, that they don't feel that it was a choice they arrived at, but, but they almost feel drawn, just drawn, that's who they are, that's where they are. Well, 
it turns out that one of my ancestors was a man named George Lane, the Reverend George Lane, who we're pretty sure was the Methodist minister to whom Joseph confided his first vision. And you may remember the result of that conversation. It's not exactly a ringing endorsement of Joseph Smith's experience. So in, in some ways that's kind of emblematic of the great difference between myself and Richard Bushman. He, 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 he's right died in the world true blue through and through Western Mormon. And I, on the other hand, come from a, a, a tradition of Methodist and Presbyterian ministers. And so first of all, there's that difference. Mormonism isn't in my blood in the same way. For me, it is, it is and has always been more of a, a faith choice, a faith option. However, having said that, I, I also would say that I, I find Mormonism the most intellectually compelling system of belief of those that I've studied or am familiar with. I think that the radical materialism of Joseph Smith, the naturalistic theology that he promulgated, is one that is especially appealing to a mind like mine, who's, who, who, I guess whose, whose background and exposure has been much more tied up with a secular world than with a Mormon world. And in fact, I'm surprised that we haven't uh, exploited the, the commonalities that we share with a secular public, rather than trying to build bridges with an evangelical community with whom we have so little, it seems to me, affinities. So I guess I've had to negotiate some of the same conflicts, but I've come at them from a different orientation and with different things in Mormonism that appeal to me that maybe Richard found particularly compelling. And my, my experience is very similar to Terrell's. I was raised Catholic. Um, I loved my faith tradition. I still love Catholicism. I think Catholicism is that is aesthetically beautiful. I love the lit liturgy, the ritual, the the fact that when you go into a Catholic mass, you really are worshiping. It's a communal worship. The audience, well, the congregation gets to participate. Those are extraordinarily beautiful. The music. I mean, it's, it's you know, I went from a high church to a low church, and it was it was a it was a decision that was fraught with um, great anxiety um, because I realized. You know, I, I realized that making this move would rupture so many things in my life. Um, the, the ability to communicate with my family um, would now no longer exist because we were on two completely different wavelengths. That there, there would no longer be any, um, any juncture where we could actually meet. Um, it, it's, you know, six months of struggling with this decision um, to choose um, to become a Mormon and to embrace the Mormon tradition. And, and my Catholicism has dogged me. Uh, most people call me a lapsed Catholic. Um, you know, I'm Catholic um, and attend the Mormon church. I'm, I'm a Catholic and a, a lover of the Mormon temple. Um, so th that's part of me. It will always be part of me. And I think there will always be this, this slight unease with which I, I live. That being said, I think it gives me a really wonderful vantage point because I have not assimilated Mormon culture. I'm, I'm, I, I, I actually am I'm not a fan of Mormon culture or American culture, quite frankly, for that matter. Um, so I think it's given me a really great vantage point. I can look into both worlds um, because I'm not, I'm not a, a member really of either of those cultural communities. So I think, think that's been very helpful. That being said, I really want to reiterate what Terrell said, is that I do believe that um, the core beliefs of Mormonism are universal, and as a result of which they are radically resonant, and um, and, and those those things, you know, sort of stay my flight when I, I wish to go back into a church that is aesthetically pleasing. You mentioned the word universal. That's one of the questions that came in was that you have mentioned uh, that you, you believe that God and Joseph Smith both were universalists. Um, what, what did you mean by that? Oh, um, absolutely. They were universalists. Um, Joseph and Hiram and B.H. Roberts and Talmadge and who am I missing? J. Reuben Clark. J. Reuben Clark all ad, ad advocated a belief that we will travel through the kingdoms and all, the entire human family, end up in the celestial kingdom at some point or another. Um, and um, th this idea of eternal 
progression. I mean, it worked really well with that. It, it changed radically in the 1960s to move up, you know, you're going to be judged and then you're going to be incarcerated in one of these kingdoms. And quite frankly, I don't see how that works with, with Joseph's initial um, view that everybody, that, that, that this plan of salvation was so encompassing and so universal and that we that we are all God's children and therefore he would ensure that, um, that, that his plan to redeem his children would include every single human being who lived on this planet. I find that really um, radically resonant and it works with my conception of God. And that was just it's sort of, I feel like we're excavating Joseph's original ideas. And um, again, you know, he, he was so ahead of his time. I mean, naturally, he was influenced by his father and his grandfather, the, the, the universalist. But, but the fact of the matter is, is he really took that and ran with that in a very literal way. And my belief, too, is this, this idea of Christ, you know, that, that it is his vulnerability, it's his vulnerability, God's vulnerability that has the power to save. Quite honestly, um, this idea of a God who has sacrificed for him himself for his creation and not the other way around it, it is incredibly powerful um, I, as, as an attractive force. And I think, you know, feeling that love and that benevolence, eventually even the most hard hearted of us will, will be turned because because it is. It, it it reaches down into the very core of every human being. So no, it's not going to be all simultaneously. You know, there are fast learners like Terrell and really slow learners like myself, and 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 God makes allowances to that. I, th I think the, the the story of the prodigal son that is my vision. That that's that is heaven, and we have our heavenly Father, and He is waiting for each one of us. You know that the scripture that you know narrow is the way. Well, it's narrow because we're the only one on it us each of us individually and christ there are billions of ways and so god uh, and times and places and so god is there you know waiting anxiously anticipating the return of each one of his children when they are ready to come home and then we have this huge face uh, this is huge feast excuse me and i'm a party girl i mean the idea that heaven is going to be one extended party where we're all going to be celebrating i mean that really rocks with me that, that's a, actually a really good segue into the last topic that I want to cover, which is um, the, the topic of agency. So there's this idea that we're all co-eternal with God. We're somehow eternally existent. And that's one of the, one of the spokes that you use in your idea of agency, that we, we're not necessarily caused. And so that means that in terms of, of causal determination, we're free because right. we're autonomous because of that. So the question is, like, if, if that's the case, co-eternal... Co-eternality, eternal, is that a co-eternality? I love it. Co-eternality seems to guarantee that uh, we already exist in unchosen conditions then. So, so there still seems to be a sense of, 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 you know, I never chose necessarily to be this way. If I was always an eternal intelligence, there wasn't a point when I chose that identity. So it still seems that we've only moved that quandary back a step. Not really, because if, if, if you can't consider yourself as, as a self-existing, we were all self-existing. And if we go back into the pre-mortal realms, you know, I love this idea of God finding himself in the midst of intelligences, you know, and, and he says, you know, this is my life. This is who I am. Are you interested? At that point, we chose and said, yes, we are interested. We would like to become like you. But what if you were already fundamentally disinclined to make that choice. Well, I, then we wouldn't have made it. <laughs> but, the, but, but it wouldn't have been your fault either, though, right? Because you were already Well, we been... wouldn't be here. Well, at, at least it would be a fault. Yeah. At, least would, like... <laughs> at least it would be a fault that we couldn't impute to any external agency. <clears throat> and I would further go, I, I would say that though I can't pretend to be able to fathom the endless, bottomless mystery of human agency, I, my heart and my mind alike tell me the existentialists had it right when they said, man is born neither good nor evil, man is born free. And he constructs his identity through his choices. How do you, put, how do you add constraint to that equation? The idea that, that Fiona mentioned earlier, that we are born into certain circumstances. And... Well, we're glad that there are constraints on that. And the playing field is uneven, because that means that it is just and legitimate for Christ to intervene, to break the cycle of a kind of a kind of endless degradation that would result from the inevitable bad choices that we make. 
Could you take that around. one step back even into pre-mortality then? Because it seems it seems that could could be the case in a pre-mortality where we also exist under constraints already. If if agency is that's interpersonal, certainly, that's certainly plausible to me. Because you can't have agency without other people around anyway. And there's right? no reason to presume that a different metaphysics or a different theology would have to obtain for the earth sphere than it does for yeah. the pre existence. And obviously we were using our agency at that time, you know, even if we take it as allegorical, as counsel and as war in heaven, you know, that the, the fact that, you know, that, that evil can coexist with God, that, that, that there was we made we, we had the opportunity to make a choice. And um, and, and, and I, th I think that's really important. So a agency really worked there. There were two competing um, uh, principles at work. And, um, and we believe as Mormons that we, we chose to come to earth because we wanted to choose the path of um, um, inevitable suffering, although most of us are probably ruining that we did at the moment. But, but, but that really is the only way. And I, I just I think this is a lovely verse. You know, we think of it as just pertaining to Christ, but it pertains to all of us, um, the, um, the idea of, um, uh, yeah, this is lovely. The things of God are of deep import and timed experience and careful and ponderous and solemn thoughts can only find them out. Thy mind, O man, if thou wilt lead a soul unto salvation, must stretch as high as the utmost heavens and search into and contemplate the lowest considerations of eternal expanse. You must commune with God. How much more dignified and noble are the thoughts of God anyway? But th this idea that we all have to do exactly what Christ did. Um, he's not just a model, but we actually need to follow in his footsteps and go to the depths uh, before we can go to the heights. So. Yeah, I, I, and I wish we had more time to, to stretch our minds. Uh, this is something we could talk about for a really long time, but I really appreciate uh, the time that you gave us today. It was a great conversation. Thanks to Terrell and Fiona Givens, authors of The God Who Weeps. No, thank you to you. Just absolutely enjoyed this conversation. It's been wonderful. Thank, thank you, you for Larry. Thanks. Thanks.